<laughs> not turn on. <laughs> Dial in. Dial in. Zoom in. Uh, this is not a Zoom. I always get it confused. Yeah. Because they have their own run the world thing going. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, well. Well, we have more time to talk if we are only the four of us. Yeah, that would be good. I'll just listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a student. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always a student, no matter what. Okay. Well, one, two more minutes to go. Well, we're technically not quite twelve thirty my time, so three, not quite three thirty. What yeah, is it? A You're little th- bit more time, a, a, a couple it, more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it um, one minute? Almost, yeah. Yeah. Well, we still need a couple of speakers, but yeah, somebody's coming here. Good to see you, Daniel. Good to see you too. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hello. You're looking very professional with your headset. Hey, there is massive construction going on next to my building. And uh, nice. this is the only way to keep the noise out. So <laughs> I feel very like, much like I'm in mission control. <laughs> that's, that's good. Oh, or you, you actually look like a hipster because all the hipsters have those big headsets. Yeah, I, I can either speak at Harassus or play a video game. <laughs> exactly. A hipster in a suit. That's <laughs> yeah. That's the next thing. <laughs> the head of the curve. <laughs> okay, I think Nilima I think we should just start. We have a couple of visitors that's really good, but I just want to tell everybody that I have been in some other panels and there are not that many people there between um five and fifteen what I have seen. Yep. And it's it's being recorded so people can go back. Anyway, welcome to this panel dealing with pathways to a new data economy. Um, It is about how do we create a trustworthy, human-centric new data economy. Today, the power of personal data and the wealth created on personal data is in the hands of either governments or big corporations. How are we putting the individual in the center of this data economy. And we have some really cool speakers today, a panelist. We have Liz Brand. She's the CEO of a UK-based consultancy, Control Shift, uh, which works with sustainable use of personal data. And it was actually the first company I heard of working with this personal data economy. And she will start. After her, we'll have Daniel S. Kern, who is the Chief Investment Officer in TFC Financial Management. It's a wealth management company who prides itself on putting its clients' best interests first. Then we have Nilima, if she's turning into this conversation. I'll introduce her later. And then we have Edwin Chan out of Los Angeles. He's the founder and creative director at EC3, a Los Angeles-based design and architecture office. He will put, his uh, perspective will be more to how to protect and control your intellectual property. And finally, we have Sylvain Duranton out of Paris. He is a global leader of BCG Gamma, who is a huge AI company um, in Boston Consulting Group with 1,300 people, data scientists and software developers who are actually building AI uh, to other, for all the companies. He will tell us more about that. Also, how we can work with AI without sitting on or owning the data. But I will turn the mic to you first, Liz. You have around eight minutes. 
<laughs> if you can do it within that, I would be really happy. We only have to find minutes all together. So do uh, do start list. Okay, super. So thanks so much for for inviting me, and it's it's really great to be here and talking about such an intor- important and relevant topic for for everybody. I think around the world. Um, Yes, as you said, I am uh, I'm Liz Brandt. I'm founder and chief exec of Control Shift. Uh, we're a boutique innovation consultancy and venture building business. Uh, we specialise in enabling businesses to unlock the economic and societal value from the trusted use of personal data. Um, so fairly relevant to this conversation, I think. Uh, Control Shift are, have, have a unique set of skills um, that we've built over the time that we've been working in this market. Um, and we work across uh, across multiple sectors internationally um, and develop new services, markets uh, and ecosystems. So that's the advert over. So we're now talking about where we think the markets is today and where I where I perceive it going and what we think are going to be um, the things that are left to do to help this market really mature and really uh, move forward. Um, as you said, I've been in the market for quite some time, 11 years is when ago is when we started the business, um, and we started it looking at the value opportunities that were available um, from personal data. We had a vision eleven years ago that the personal data economy was um, that we needed to design was about empowering individuals, human centric as you would call it, um, empowering them with their data that enables them to use their data and make better decisions and manage their lives more effectively. And there are other obviously other reasons to use personal data but this value opportunity is enormous and and it's the new frontier really in the data economy Um, during the years we have worked with governments and legislators and regulators um, and helped them to understand those value opportunities and how to shape the market so that not only is it valuable but it's safe and it's easy no market exists unless it's valuable safe and easy so this is what we've been concentrating on for the first few years uh, uh, helping to develop this market we also work with think tanks um, such as citra in finland who are very much focused on human-centric design of of our our future digital economy Um, nesta in the uk the world economic forum we continue to work with those organizations helping to develop the market to be both safe and easy. And and, um, we've also worked with a lot of blue chip organisations, otherwise I'd be a very skinny person and so would my children, I think. Um, uh, We've worked across lots of markets, as I said, um, insurance such as Suncorp in Australia, banks such as Barclays or Deutsche Bank, social media companies such as Facebook, can you believe, Uh, big tech companies such as Amazon Web Services, Telcos, Telefonica, energy companies uh, and more, all very interested in how they how they move to this new digital economy, this new personal information economy, how to design smart services that enable and empower those individuals with their data and help them make better decisions and manage their lives better. And that's where there are really big opportunities. So if I talk to those opportunities, the opportunity to help people make better decisions the opportunity to help manage their lives better is enormous. And you look at it and go, well, well, how, how does that work then? If you're actually enabling and empowering that data into the market, where does that actually deliver value? Well, our economic study for the UK government, we did a, a, a longitudinal study, um, sorry, a, a, a six month study of uh, the economic opportunities of data portability, empowering the individuals with their data for the UK government. It exposed a 27.8 billion efficiency and productivity gain in the UK economy, which is only the very tip. So imagine if you've got that data more available, how much more productive could an organisation be if they have access to more data? Economists love this one. This is you know, network externalities gone mad. So, But the far bigger opportunity by a long way is the one that we've really been focusing on, which is how to combine the, that personal data to be used for individuals to help them make those better decisions. Things like help them manage their money better, help them manage their health better, their mental well-being better, help them manage their career. The data that we currently use to help manage our businesses better is absolutely, it's, it's 
it's gold dust to individuals to help them manage their lives better. And I always say, stop me having to sit down on a Sunday morning and try and piece together all this information to try and feed it to the banks, the insurance companies, the telecommunications companies. Just make the data work for me so that I can have a Sunday morning with my kids. That would be better. So the smart services that we're, we're talking about are big opportunities for businesses. And that's really where we're focusing that they contribute to the top line in delivering new value and propositions, and they contribute to the bottom line by helping them to create better customer journeys, stronger relationships, and alongside that efficiencies, as I talked about before, they're also hugely value from, valuable from a societal perspective, and that's also what The Economist spoke to. The ability for us to better manage our lives makes society more efficient and effective and, 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 and the rails run more smoothly. So, for instance, we're working on a mental health service at the moment where we're helping individuals to understand their mental well-being better, pull back the need for mental health services, better management of their lives, stops us spending more money on, on mental health services, helps us actually find the right mental health services should, should we need them. Um, so, and, and that that preventative opportunity is is absolutely enormous. So, the ability to prevent people falling into debt, the ability to help help people prevent people getting ill, gain longevity, gain five extra years of healthy life. These are enormous opportunities for individuals, but obviously enormous opportunities for our economy and society. Um, and, and that data, that data that you can get once you start to make it available in, in the marketplace, you know, the telco data, the finance data, the energy data, once you start to release that, you can actually shine that light into people's lives or enable them to shine that light into their lives um, and, and enable that, that value to flow. So we have come quite a long way in 11 years. It has felt quite slow whilst I've been trod treading the paths, but it has actually... We've come a long way. So businesses now see the, the opportunity. They now see the business opportunity. They can see the new business models and they can see the new value opportunities. Consumers, you'd say, well, you know, they're still very nervous, but actually they've got more confident with the way the data is used and they're more demanding. Actually, that's the other thing that we're seeing. They're much more demanding of the digital services that they, that they access and use. And they want those services to be personalized and they want them to fit their lives. with the Data Governance Act, which is on the table and due to go through, fingers crossed, this year, which it starts to actually validate data facilitators that act on behalf of the individuals to actually enable them to better use that data and stay safe. And, of course, in Australia, you've got the customer data rights. In South America, in countries like Brazil, they're already starting to implement data portability. And recently, we were intending an FTC workshop in the USA who are looking at data portability as a potential opportunity for future digital economy. So it's all really, really moving. And alongside that, of course, we can't ignore the fact that open banking or PSD2, so legislation in Europe, has really opened up people's eyes to this opportunity. So that is the opening up of data from retail banks, enabling that data to be used by individuals, which is which is born personal financial management tools and, and, and far more to help individuals to manage their lives better. And, and that data is shared within a strong governance framework, which is really key. And that, that is starting to get embedded in the technology. So we're now, you know, we've got business that are starting to really move, consumers that are starting to really move, legislation that's starting to really move, and technology that's really moving and embedding this governance structure, these governance structures in the technology that enables this market to work. So if you wrap that all up, there's a huge amount that's moving and has moved and, that, and the opportunity is upon us. And I know we're all in the midst of the, the wrath of the pandemic. However, the wrath of the pandemic, as we all know, has brought with it its own digital uh, accelerant. You know, we're working with businesses are saying we're thinking six years in six months. That's what we're doing. We're transforming the business. And it really is accelerating what's going on and how people are thinking about using personal data. But 
we aren't there yet. Um, you know, we're still in the UK, for instance, uh, looking at smart data, which is releasing energy data, telco data, pensions data, insurance data, government data. We haven't got standards for that data yet. We haven't got we haven't got we haven't got a way to govern it. We haven't got a way to make that customer experience the same. And, and, and the way that I know that I'm safe to be the same across all that data. Uh, and to make it really scale, you have to do that. So you're still handcrafting. I think I'm coming to the end of my time. Yes. Uh, so you're still hand, having to handcraft a lot of this stuff. But the value can be had right now. You can and people are designing this value. And, and I think we're coming to a point where we, we, we have to start asking ourselves, how do we move forward from here? Is it going to be a de jure approach? Or is it going to be a de facto approach? Are we going to rely on our governments to design this? Or are we going to have market makers who will come in and actually make this market happen? People will actually start to create the frameworks, create the standard structures, create the governance models, create the liability models. And we are already talking to companies who are looking to create that de facto position in market. I think Game on, basically. You know, everything starts to line up. I think, you know, hold on to your hats. This is going to be a wild ride for the next 10 years. There is a lot to be done. Thank you so much, Liz. Really, really interesting. I'll get back to you with questions, but we want to hear Daniel now, Daniel Kern, um, from a more uh, financial perspective. Thank you. Um, Liz, you're a, tough, you're a tough act to follow. Um, I come at this uh, from from the the lens, looking through the lens of of an investor, and I, uh, in all of this, I see big threats and alongside big opportunities. And I'll start with the you know more the negative side. Let's let's talk about the threats. Um, I, I think there are threats associated with um, greater consumer control of their data and changes in government oversight over the use of personal data. And those threats really hit home in some of the leading uh, U.S. technology and communications companies. The, their business models um, really rely on free and readily available personal data. Um, and you can see this battle between Apple and Facebook over privacy as an indication of how high the stakes are when data is concerned. Um, Apple's software update will make it easier for iPhone users to stop apps like Facebook's from tracking them around the web, and that has huge potential cost and revenue implications for Facebook and for, for others. Certainly, targeted ads potentially become a lot less effective if there are regulatory or other barriers on the sharing of, of information. And a lot of the economics behind some of these platform companies are tied to powerful network effects. And if you start to erode those network effects, um, that, uh, that, that could mean a change uh, undermining the market value of, of many of these companies. Um, it's also interesting in the States to see the scrutiny over Amazon's use of non-public data from third-party sellers um, in the way that they use that to benefit their private label offerings. Um, I'm really curious. We're early days yet here, really early hours yet. I'm going to be really curious to see the reaction to Amazon's plan to provide telehealth services to companies. I'm not sure exactly how much I want Amazon to know about me, and it'll be interesting to see what the feedback is from companies thinking about using those telehealth services. And this isn't just uh, a, a, an American or a European issue. Um, China is also, in their own way, reviewing the use of personal data by the big Chinese platform companies. So that's, you know, that's the, the glass is half empty, that, that side of things. If we turn to the opportunities, and, and really a lot of this will dovetail what, what Liz has said, there are huge opportunities for companies that can benefit from new or modified applications of personal data. And financial services is a really good place to start. I think about my own firm, and we do uh, financial planning for individuals and, and families. We have a devil of a time aggregating data from all of their the different tentacles of their, their life. 
being able to wrap our arms around our clients' mortgages and being able to see in one place, oh, these 12 clients have mortgages that we should refinance. We can get a lower rate. Seeing their insurance, um, uh, their, their insurance contracts, we, it, it is quite a process to get our arms around insurance, spending, mortgages, other accounts. Um, there are data aggregation services, but it's still pretty primitive. So that's an, a clear area of potential. In thinking about China, um, I know that uh, the Alibaba affiliate and financial has been in the in the headlines more because their IPO is pulled by the Chinese government. Um, but it's really interesting to think about Ant. Um, they arguably have a better understanding of consumer creditworthiness in China than China China's banks. And I can see parallels in other parts of the world to that, where if you have access to data about consumer behavior, um, there's the potential to really disintermediate the traditional financial system. Extending that maybe to another another uh, level, Tesla and other electronic vehicle makers, ultimately, the more that they build autonomous driving capabilities um, and monitoring capabilities into their system, I could see them stepping into the insurance space because they'll understand driver behavior better than the the big insurance companies. Now, as a caveat to that, um, in my days working for a trillion-dollar financial organization, we thought about trying to disintermediate the the insurance market, and our founder CEO said, I don't want to be regulated by 50 state insurance regulators, and uh, I'm okay staying with asset management and and being a broker-dealer. I don't want any part of insurance, insurance regulation. Um, health monitoring, energy usage tips and optimization, I think retail can be fundamentally transformed by, by data and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I, I see this when, when I started out as an investor, the concept of shelf space in physical stores was a big barrier to entry and a big competitive moat. The ability to completely bypass brick and mortar stores and the ability to see personal shopping data and to even, I think about the concept of virtual fittings and being able to uh, shop and really effectively avoid, avoid stores. All of those things are part of this new data economy. So I think that's a, a pretty good place to uh, give give the floor over and hopefully ha- leave our, ourselves time to explore more of these issues in the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Okay, Edwin, do you want to join in and uh, give in your perspective to this? Yeah, well, um, Daniel, um, that was really, really interesting. Um, and uh, I'm, as I mentioned to Pernell, I, I, I'm definitely the outlier in a sense because uh, I'm not in the, the not technically in the data economy. Uh, I'm an architect in a conventional sense. As I said, I'm a brick and mortar kind of architect. However, um, as I listened to your presentation, um, I thought that we actually overlap in, in many ways. Uh, and, and it is interesting so I thought I would share with you some of my personal stories and, and we can have a discussion. See, most people think of architecture as, you know, you're going to go and hire an architect to build a house or, you know, build a shopping center and so on and so forth. But actually, a lot of what I've been doing, uh, other than just conventional sort of cultural facilities, it's actually helping cities or institutions, we define their brand, so to speak, using design and architecture. So a few years ago, uh, I'm going to deviate a little bit from my script because I'm just so inspired by Daniel's speech. So I'm going to tell this story. Pernell, you know this a little bit, is that I was uh, an, um, hired by a Silicon Valley tech company uh, whose name will remain anonymous, but... I'm very sure that everybody used their product many times during the day. And 
this particular company has grown to this level that they don't want they want to change their identity so to speak change their branding from what they're currently being known for to a kind of a lifestyle brand and so they hire us to help them design a series uh, a store like the Apple store except it's not the Apple store to help them launch a product which it's also in the market but it's going to be a much more aggressive launch of this product uh, that is going to get into the consumer's home and by using their product they would of course have access in a smart way to the way you live so uh, so in indirectly it affects uh, the topic that we're talking about is through architecture indirectly it could potentially facilitate this company to rebrand their identity and have more control and therefore access to all of our personal data. Um, so that's kind of an one, one level of, of overlap. But on a more personal level, you know, obviously in the old days, our sort of creative capital is sort of founded on sort of kind of analog world objects. So, you know, we used to design buildings and the building kind of exists in the real way. But of course, now in the digital age, um, our buildings, our, our creativity actually exists in the digital realm as a digital model. So then this is a topic that I've been having a lot of discussion on with my IT guy. And they said, Edwin, we need to have a firewall. Uh, on the server to keep people from hacking into your system. And I have been kind of very ambivalent about it. I said, well, you know, there's nothing in my creative realm that is actually worth people hacking into or, or anything like that. Uh, so I don't see any value in terms of my own kind of the creative digital data economy. But, but for now, something happened since I was, we spoke last time. Uh, it was brought to my attention that a project that I worked on uh, for Detroit has actually been duplicated without my knowledge in Ohio uh, for whatever reason. And in fact, I had a meeting yesterday um, with the client and I said, well, are you bothered by this? Uh, do you want to take action uh, to stop this from happening? Is somebody using the digital database? because it's kind of just out there in the clouds and somebody could just duplicate it. In the old days, it was more difficult. You actually had to go and physically do something to, to have a forgery, but now you can just, a matter of second, you can have the whole database. And, and my client actually said something I thought is fairly provocative here in the sense that in the analog world, uh, originality has a value that you know, the more original you have, the value kind of goes up. Now he said, well, if somebody's actually taken the time to download your database and, and take it, the, rep, the, the duplication of this actually adds value to the original. That's what my client said. So in other words, he's making an analogy between say, for example, you can have one Louis Vuitton bag, that's one thing, but if the Chinese trying to copy the Louis Vuitton bag, the original actually increases in value, which is something that I actually haven't thought about. So my client is not a bit concerned about this issue at all. And I'm a little bit on, uh, ambivalent about it. So maybe I can learn from the, the, the expert panel here. They can give me some advice what to do about this little dilemma that we our profession is facing. So then the third story that I wanted to share, again, it relates to China. So a couple of years ago, I was teaching in a very well-known university in Shanghai. So now in architecture, of course, or in any kind of creative profession, we always place a value on, again, the idea of the originality of the intellectual property. So when I taught at Harvard, for example, the students would go out of their way to try to be, to outdo each other in terms of their originality. So that's our Western value system. Now in China, I have a class of 20 student people, uh, 20 students, and it turned out in the final review, five of them are identical copies of each other in the same class. 
So I was totally mind boggled by this. And these are young people. They're not professional hackers or, or anything like that. Not in the sort of, you know, commercial sense of the word. So I, I asked him, I said, well, if you were in this class and you spend so much time coming up with this original idea, um, you know, you have it in the, you know, you, why do you share your computer information with the other people? And they looked at me and they go, as if this concept of personal ownership of their database, it's a new concept for them. They said, but why? Isn't it just as long as it's on the internet, it's open. So maybe I would just, and this is it. They said it in the most innocent way. It's not by any means trying to cover up anything. So maybe I should just leave this with this very provocative question and, and we'll save that for the later discussion. Thank you so much, Edwin. Okay, our final panelist is Sylvain Duranton from BG Gamma, and he will uh, share uh, some news from a very new report, which has not even been published yet, yet on um, responsible AI, and also um, focusing a bit on how to actually work with that AI without sitting on or owning the data. No, thank, thank you all, and uh, thank you for the very inspiring uh, ideas that have been shared. Uh, I won't repeat too much on how much value can be unlocked by better use of uh, all sorts of personal information. Uh, you know, uh, some some of our teams have been working, uh, you know, with uh, some Medicaid, Medicare operators in the U.S., and by better using personal data of people with their consent, you can get to massive impact in terms of improvement of, uh, you know, the quality of life of people, checking adherence to some treatments and all that, reducing the number of days people spent in hospital. I've seen in some countries some, uh, you know, insurance bi business build uh, on the back of a, an airline, uh, of the customer program of an airline. Uh, you know, you, I've, I've seen fintech who manage, you know, to send real time the exact right loan with the pre-approved rate for people who are purchasing big items in supermarkets. So there's lots to do here. And I think uh, imagination is quite infinite. Regarding the regulation on those data and everything, uh, my conviction is regulation is needed. Regulation is building frameworks, is putting table stake. And it's true that Europe has been pushing some things which have been uh, pretty innovative uh, and important. And the data governance act is super important. That said, the topic is so complex, I feel that it will be difficult for regulation to cover every situation, every case accurately. And at some point, regulation provides a sort of table stake. On top of that table stake, there will be two things. Companies which will go much further in terms of adhering not just to the law, but to the principle and going further. And some new players as the data facilitators or others you know, can, can start being uh, at play. And one example on that, just on GDPR, for instance, I've been working with a large uh, you know, coffee chain, uh, in global coffee chain, who wanted to really you know, boost their uh, their loyalty programs with a very advanced uh, promos. Uh, and for instance, you know, they could create promotion, not just for you. And if you take this or that product, you personally, you would get some rebate, but to you and some of your friends. And of course, if your friends are involved and it's a promo targeted to a group of friends, you know, there's lots of excitement and it's it's quite powerful. But, you know, Letting someone know that you know who their friends are is extremely sensitive because this is not information you can throw out people and say, by the way, our AI has discovered that you always hang out with this group of people, so we know that probably you, you know each other. And what they did is build a full system of, no, no, most companies, they go through the consent uh, system from uh, GDPR, just hoping that everyone will click as fast as possible on OK without really understanding what they do. They took the exact opposite. What they did is, okay, we can do nothing with your data. You receive no promo, nothing. We can do we we can do this type of things with your data. That the type of promo you would get on that. Do you give us consent? One question is, for instance, geolocalization. Do you want some geolocalized promotions when we know you're in a city or an airport or not? And doing that, I think companies you know understand the spirit of of, of GDPR and go beyond that. And I think in the way the regulation is built and all that, it's important to anticipate that some of the winning companies will be pushing uh, into this direction. Another thing, 
uh, uh, another angle on the uh, on the topic that you were uh, per in, uh, 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 alluding to is also beyond the regulation, you know, and assuming we'll have data facilitators and all that, we still are confronted with a massive technical problem on first, will institutions, individuals really want to fully share their data or not? And, you know, one genius <laughs> said data is the new oil. And I think it was a strong prophecy to say that. But this has killed part of the business because many institutions, many people feel, I have oil with my data, I don't want to share with anyone, and this is also stopping some business. And beyond regulation, technology can help. And for instance, they, there are techniques now which are called uh, confidential computing or federated learning, for instance, where you know players don't have to share their data to have AI learn from different sets of data which are fully decentralized in a unified way. And these techniques are already active, you know, and playing a big role, for instance, in pharma, where you know hospitals don't want to share their data and give away their data. But, you know, to look for certain trends, patterns, to identify certain signals, they are okay to open their data because they keep the full ownership. It's just, you know, something that they understand is done out of the data and from a trust vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, their patients and, you know, also with the value that is getting out of the data that they share, it's a very clean way to operate. And I think this will help. Beyond that, it's important from a technical standpoint to make sure that there are sometimes more data standards. Because in some ecosystem, even if people are ready to share data, it's very difficult to make sense out of them because it is so patchy and it requires enormous technical work. And I think we will see the emergence of some, uh, you know, standardized data platform, you know, multi-users into some ecosystem, which will allow much is the use and sharing of data. And that's a bit the spirit of what uh, Singapore has done uh, with their uh, standardized uh, data platform for uh, e-commerce transaction. And my last topic is, you know, so yes, regulation is important, but, you know, companies will go beyond, tech will help, trust is super important. And the more we go, I think the more uh, it will be critical for companies to be trusted. And responsible AI is a big topic. And if you look at responsible AI, you have more than 65 frameworks which have been announced on, you know, principles for responsible AI from EU, EOCD, countries, whatever, institution, foundation, you have them all over the place. And what we did as BCG uh, Gamma, we interviewed 2,000 people across uh, companies with uh, at least 1,000 employees to much larger ones across the world. And we have uh, uh, surveyed like, you know, uh, 1,000 companies on that. Not to see whether they believed in the principle, what, what they were doing exactly on the AI principles. And uh, several things are pretty interesting. The first one, which I, I think is the most important insight from the survey, when you survey companies on that topic, 40% will claim we do that for a business reason, 20% for compliance reason, really showing that companies understand there's a big value to do that, and it's a sort of imperative. We lack maturity. More than 50% of companies massively overestimate how responsible they are versus, you know, what we see when we really audit uh, uh, what they do. So that's another, I think, interesting learning and showing a bit that uh, the <laughs> there is some education that needs to take place. If we look at the different dimension uh, of the framework, you know, one place where companies have put their act together massively is privacy and, and data. So having systems to ensure privacy, governance, and all that, it's done because regulation pushed companies uh, to do this, and that's the value of regulation. Then you have topics which are untouched. Fairness and equity, impact on social environment, and, you know, making sure that humans stay in the loop just to prevent, you know, AI catastrophes. On those three, everyone is claiming, yes, these are super important principles. Very little progress uh, has been made, uh, has been made so far on the three. On uh, the two other dimensions, accountability, do you have people in charge, really, of outcome who put their neck? Do you have real process to check these things? Some progress, not as far as data and privacy, but some progress. And on the, on the last one, which is everything related to the robustness of the tech procedures, how do you test? How do you make sure your algos are not vulnerable to adversarial attack? 
Do you have someone which is in charge of testing, which is different from the person which is in charge of building? These type of things, you know, mid-ground. Some progress, not enough. And an interesting thing, uh, if you take the leading companies on uh, responsible AI, so the top like 25%, 70% are super proud and they have appointed like chief responsible AI officer. The people that can check the process are good, ethics is good and all that. Um, The flow is only 25% of them are not the CDO or the CIO. And of course, you need someone which is out of the line to play that role, not someone which is like fully in the line if you want some real check and balances. So these are some of the learning that we do. And we think that, you know, making sure that companies progress and especially, you know, on a fairness, equity, have not just the words, but real things, measuring the impact of uh, the societal and environment impact of what they do. And they are tools. We have developed some, others have developed some. There's a big need to accelerate on those topics if we want to, to be able to use more data, more personal data, and to unlock some of the, I would say, public-like resistance to, to the full deployment of AI. So that's, that's okay. Thank you very um, much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sylvain. I guess you did not, uh, I know that your report is out the 30th of March. And, and if anybody wanted, I guess you can share it after then. That, of course, of but course. Um, you did not ask uh, the companies about their view on the new data economy and individual data control, or if they, no, I guess that could be a really relevant question. Yeah, I think in terms of use of uh, personal data, I think all companies are convinced that it's a gold mine. And, and that's why, by the way, regulators have put some barriers and all that. Yeah. For companies, understanding, you know, what the framework will be so that being like, you know, safe, quote unquote, from a legal standpoint and trusted from a cons- consumer standpoint, but also other companies, is clearly an overarching concern for all of them because, you know, yeah. that required to unlock the second wave of, uh, you know, uh, of money uh, for AI as, you know, uh, Liz or, or Daniel uh, have been sharing uh, earlier. Okay, we only have five minutes left, actually. <laughs> But Liz, can you, can you ref- reflect on any of this, maybe also on how to actually combine responsible AI with individual data control. Do you have any thoughts on that? <clears throat> There's a a load of them. And, you know, the black box that AI can create is is very challenging. However, I think as you get it closer to the individual and it works on behalf of the individual rather than sitting within the walls of an organization, it becomes a lot easier. So if you can create transparency in the data that's being used, control over how that data is actually used, people get a sense. The, so you can start to understand how these models are actually working and the decisions they're actually making on your behalf. And there's some great examples um, that have been created of standard user experience patterns that start to um, expose and enable organizations to expose how those AI models are actually working. Putting that in front of the individual. For, for us, putting that in front of the individual is, is I don't know what the expression translates into other countries, but like it's the canary in the mind. So it's the thing that cries out when something's wrong. And if you can get it close to the consumer, you keep everybody honest. Yeah. And, and that's one of the key things, I think, that we can actually take from this. You get it close to the consumer, make it transparent, make it exposed. You can remove, a, oddly, you can remove a lot of risk, I think, from, from your business. Um, can you give us some of the examples? You said there are great examples. Can you give us one or two examples? Yeah, I mean, there's some really, there's, um, there's a really, some really interesting ones about why you got fined for speeding, for instance. So, you know, like you've gone through this process and, it, and, it's, and it's making this decision. I think it was speeding. What was it? So it's something like that. And, and it's, and it's oh, no, it, was, it wasn't, sorry. It was a decision about um, what health service you were going to get, some, something along those lines. And it was basically just, 
it was really clean. It's a really clean design. It uses the data. It tells you what data it's going to use. It tells you what the results have been and why it's come to those conclusions. It's really straightforward. So, you know, and, and I understand, you know, AI models get extraordinarily complicated. But in my world, where we're looking at the value that enables individuals to make better decisions, those decisions can be made really close to individuals. They don't have to be made inside an organisation. They can be made for and with the individual. And I think the other thing that's really fascinating when you start looking at predictive modelling and the use of data, you know, people are going, oh, we can predict outcomes. You know, we've got 12 years of data of families, 5,000 families. We can start to predict what people's educational outcomes are. Well, no, actually you can't because... You know, Fred might have looked like he was pretty pretty much on it, right? He was about six, but actually what happened was all sorts of things happened in his life. He got sick or his parents split up or, you know, they went bust or whatever it was, and suddenly his outcomes have totally changed. So if you can, you can sort of surely start to look at sort of broad brush, longitudinal direction, but you have to contextualise it in people's lives, and that's when those personal AI models can start to really enable people to actually move the move their journeys around so you know there, there's ai and there's ai i think thank you very much edwin and dan and you will get the last uh, comments before we have to round off and or we have to finish uh, are there anything on this uh, well, uh the responsible ai and uh, the personal the new data economy you want to comment on I think the only thing that I that I'll say in closing is just to dovetail on Liz's final point, which is that I think that that the combination of machine and human judgment um, far surpasses um, either one in isolation. I think the the combination of of of, of human judgment and artificial intelligence, um, you know, beats artificial intelligence in a vacuum or human judgment uninformed by data. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I would agree with uh, with what Daniel said. I think one word